Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Groß and it is my great pleasure to welcome Pat Divine in today's episode with his 1988 book Democracy and Economic Planning, The Political Economy of a Self-Governing Society, Pat Devine put forward a concrete formal model of how democratic economic planning could actually work. And it is one of the essential reads for people interested in the debate, I would say. Since then, he has contributed to the topic in multiple publications. Amongst others, he was the guest editor of the 2002 special issue of Science and Society. And as regular listeners will know, these special issues are part of the NV Visioning Socialism Project, which is concerned with pushing forward the debate around democratic economic planning. And these special issues, they are released every 10 years. And I already mentioned he was guest editor in 2002 and we now have 2022. So this year has been one of those years where a new special issue came out. And I used this as an opportunity to record a small mini series of interviews with central authors involved in this science and society project called Envisioning Socialism. The episodes with Robin Hanel on Paracon and with David Leipman on multi-level democratic iterative coordination have been released already and the release of today's episode with Pat Devine concludes this mini-series within Future Histories, even though, of course, the planning debate in a broader sense will stay with us since this is one of the main strands of Future Histories, so to speak. Before we start, I would like to thank Thank Wilfried, Lukas, Karl, Fabian, Benedikt and Marie for their kind donations. And I want to point you all to the English episodes only RSS feed and homepage. So if you are an English speaker, you can simply subscribe to the English episodes of Future Histories now through the RSS feed or visit the homepage, of course, futurehistories-international.com. So please subscribe and tell all of your friends. And now please enjoy today's episode with Pat Devine on negotiated coordination. Welcome, Pat. Thank you very much. Let's start with a definition. What is democratic planning? Well, I, I came to the idea of democratic planning. Uh, we'll probably come partly to this later on as well, through thinking about the fact that Soviet-style top-down planning uh, proved not to work, and the principal alternative that certainly people who continued to believe uh, that some sort of socialist economy was necessary turned out to be uh, market socialism. And I wasn't happy with market socialism, because uh, it seemed to me that particularly uh, from Marx's work, the critique of the Gotha program, um, there were sort of two fundamental features of a post-capitalist society. One was uh, the end of exploitation. Well, market socialist enterprises, you could argue, were able to deal with that. But the other was the end of the anarchy of production. And the anarchy of production, in effect, uh, is the same thing as Adam Smith's invisible hand or what today is called market forces. Um, and since market socialism, although it changed the character of the enterprise and therefore you could say abolished or potentially abolished uh, exploitation, it didn't deal with the anarchy of production. And so what happened was that... Uh, autonomous enterprises, say state-owned or worker cooperatives or whatever, uh, competed against one another. That's what market forces are about. And uh, that was intended to be a way of ensuring that there was incentive structures for enterprises to make sure that they were producing efficiently and what consumers, users wanted. But that seemed to me to violate the second essential feature of Marx's view of uh, socialism. Um, and so I thought, well, what are the alternatives? 
And uh, the alternative seemed to be not to rely on um, competition as a mechanism, but rather to rely upon cooperation, discussion, negotiation. And uh, that's why I developed this idea of a layered structure of uh, decision making and implementation based on the principle of subsidiarity, which if it originally comes from, believe it or not, the Catholic Church, the concept of subsidiarity, uh, where decisions, at least in principle, are to be taken and implemented at the um, most local level that is consistent with all people affected by the decisions, being involved in making them and carrying them out. So um, that essentially is what led me to look at the history of working class and popular involvement struggles and demands to be involved in decision making, not just political decision making, but also decision making with respect to the economy. And uh, there are historical examples of that. But what really led me in this direction was the fact that um, in the 1970s, which you, of course, won't remember, but um, the 1970s was, if you like, a crucial turning point for the capitalist world because it was um, the, the decade in which inflation got completely out of control. So in the UK, in the middle of 1975, the rate of inflation had reached 50% per annum. Now that for a developed capitalist country is very high. Um, and it was clear that something had to be done about it. And there were two um, approaches to it. One which the uh, Polish economy, uh, Michael Kolecki, uh, had predicted in the 1940s during the Second World War, which was, well, the idea that unemployment is a problem for capitalism, which is, of course, what socially involved people thought, unemployment's a bad thing. But Kolecki argued that the fact of the matter is the smooth functioning of capitalism depends on unemployment. It's a structural feature of capitalism. And therefore, if you were going to... Uh, as happened at the end of the Second World War, if you were going to um, follow the work and the expectations that had been done during the war, summed up for, for the UK in the report of Beveridge, full employment in a free society, where a free society was, of course, a free capitalist society, um, then how would it work? And um, the problem with full employment for capitalism, as Kolecki saw it, was that it meant that the working class was stronger in full employment situation, both in terms of the negotiations to get a job, but secondly, also, when um, you had a job and you were working in an enterprise and you wanted to have some say in how it was done, how it was being run. So Kolecki predicted that if we had full employment, it would cause problems, as indeed it did in the 1970s, when full employment resulted in this decade, really, of, of mounting uh, inflation. And there were basically two ways of um, dealing with that. One was, not that it was put this way, but in fact, it's what happened. One was to recreate unemployment, which is what happened with the advent of neoliberalism, Thatcher, um, Reagan, uh, and so on. But the other was to do a deal with the unions and to say, look, if we get wage, money wage increases at a higher rate than the increase in the rate of productivity, then there's going, there's, that's going to result in price increases. Because if you've got an oligopolistic situation, as you had, in all the developed capitalist countries. An enterprise could increase prices without altering its competitive position with respect to other enterprises, because 
the oligopolistic situation was one in which they had to take account of one another's actions. And so if one enterprise increased prices, the others would do the same without altering their relative positions. Um, so the proposal that was put forward in the UK was to have a prices and incomes policy, whereby the unions representing labor, uh, the capitalist organizations uh, and the uh, government would come together to agree on what age increases there would be, what prices, price increases there would be, and that would solve the problem. Now, at that time, I was um, on the Economic Advisory Committee of the Communist Party in the UK, and um, we were in a minority there saying, look, this is a crisis, something's got to be done about it. What should happen, we think, is that the unions and the Labour Party and the Communist Party should support a prices and incomes policy, but on condition. And the conditions were, well, since real income increases would depend on the increase in productivity on the one hand, and the distribution of output between profits and wages on the other hand, prices and incomes policies have to be policies in which it's agreed that trade unions can be involved in the decisions that affect the rate of productivity increase. And that meant uh, basically impinging on managerial prerogatives, the prerogatives of capital. They're the ones who decide on investment, on new technology and so on. Unions had to be involved in taking those decisions as one of the conditions. The other was there had to be an agreement on the share between wages and profits. And that meant that unions, and when I say unions, I'm talking to, of the representatives of, of the workers, obviously, would have to agree on whether the distribution between wages and profits was one they were prepared to accept. Now, that actually would have involved a move towards increasing social control over the decisions to do with economic matters and increasing the input of workers in those decisions. And we saw that as a step towards eventually uh, getting rid of the capitalist element by moving towards taking over um, ownership, social ownership of the enterprises. So that you can see is the beginnings of negotiation and agreement and coordination. And that in a sense was the, the beginnings of my thoughts on how one would move toward, didn't want, we didn't want a top-down plan system. I mean, we had that to some extent in the nationalized industries, but they were rather paternalistic um, and they didn't involve workers or for that matter, consumers and users in the decisions of, to, with respect to the in industry. What happened was that they were made by uh, people who thought they were doing the right thing for people rather than people doing things for themselves. So that's the origin of it. And that's why it had to be a structured layer uh, combining, if you like, centralized decisions where the issues at stake affected everybody. And then more localized decisions where the decisions involved only affected, uh, well, in the case of say the running of an enterprise, the workers in that enterprise. So they would operate with an enterprise in which the overall criteria were set more generally, but how to operate and implement uh, within the enterprise those criteria was up to the people working in the enterprise and doing it. So that's why it needed to be a structured layer of um, decision making. And um, it meant that workers, instead of being passive recipients of decisions that other people had made was in fact, were in fact themselves involved as agents in making the decisions. So it was also, we thought anyway, a way in which you could move towards um, within still a capitalist system towards overcoming the uh, various forms of alienation that are created by the operation of capitalism. So that is basically what, uh, 
the model is about. It's about enabling people at different levels in relation to different decisions and in different ways to be involved in those decisions so that they feel some sort of responsibility for them at the same time as making sure that they are decisions that they feel are in their interests, but as in not only in their interests, but in the interest of other people who will also be affected by the uh, decision, which is why they too have to be involved in the process of making the decision. So that's a long winded way of saying what well, I see the underlying sort of focus of democratic planning is based upon participation. And it's very nice to see that this is actually coming from a very practical involvement that you had with actual politics. Yes, absolutely. And then you try to yeah. uh, like um, form a model around these experiences, actually. That's very yes. interesting. I could just add that during that period of uh, the prices and incomes policy, uh, there was also drawn up initially, funnily enough, by a conservative government But then they lost power or lost the election. And so there was then a Labour government. And they formed, uh, a, a, there was a, a national plan was drawn up in the UK. And this national plan was a response to the fact that with the end of um, uh, colonialism, with the end of imperialism, well, maybe not the end, but the weakening of it, that privileged position that it gave the UK economy uh, was undermined. And so the UK economy was losing way to other economies, with it, all capitalist economies, but it was becoming relatively weaker. And that process, of course, has gone on and on and on ever since. But um, so that meant that um, something had to be done, as it were. Productivity increases were small, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so a national plan was drawn up. And um, the national plan, again, was drawn up by discussion between the government, the unions, and the employers' representatives. And they agreed on plans to improve the performance of the economy. And then underneath that, they, that was called the National Economic Development Council, National Economic Development Council, which came to be known as a NEDI for some reason or other. And underneath that, there were little neddies, uh, which were comparable bodies for each industry. So each industry would have a little neddy where the trade unions representing workers in that industry, uh, the government or the local government and the um, employers organizations at that level would again come together and see how they would best implement the provisions of the overall plan within their particular industry. So that was another, if you like, example of a layered process of decision-making. Uh, the national plan failed, but that's another matter. So we are already uh, very like deep in the subject matter. I think maybe to kind of also introduce the audience uh, to the topic, let's approach the, the thing on a more abstract level. I mean, you uh, very nicely uh, elaborated how you came to your specific model of negotiated coordination, but maybe just as a very like short description, an abstract description, what are the main characteristics of a, a democratic planned economy in general compared to other types of political economy? Well, I suppose at the most general level, it means that the, uh, the society, whether it's a local, local society or a regional society or a national society or a international society or a global society, all these different levels, they all um, get together to decide at the appropriate level what the policies that would uh, contribute to human well-being, the best policies to contribute to human well-being, would be as they currently saw things. And then they would discuss again at the different levels how to implement that. So, for example, take the issue of climate change at the moment, which is obviously a very hot issue, probably the most important issue. So. 
it's quite clear what needs to be done at a global level. But it's not at all clear that it's going to be done. And that is because of the conflicting interests of uh, the different countries and within the different countries, the different sectors of public opinion, the different sectors of the economy and so on. So what, what this would do would be to say, OK, so at that level, global level, there would be agreement reached upon what needed to be done in order to deal with the climate change, the loss of biodiversity, global warming, and all the rest of it. And then there would have to be agreement on how what needed to be done would be distributed between the different countries. Uh, and that would obviously have to depend upon the historical record that is to say, the developed capitalist countries are the ones most responsible for the climate crisis and the loss of biodiversity. Not the only ones, but the main ones. And that would obviously have to be reflected in the decisions about how much of what needed to be done had to be done by the different countries. And a similar process would apply uh, within each country and then within each country, within each region, and then within each region, it, locality. So it would give people directly and indirectly control over what needed to be done in order to contribute best to human flourishing, taking into account the different positions that uh, different parts of the globe, different sections of the community um, are in, different responsibilities, how you uh, were going to agree on what would be a reasonably fair um, way of dealing with this. And the point that one has to realise is that this is not, sounds implausible in our existing society, because that's not how capitalism works. Uh, but if you're in a socialist society, some people thought of a socialist society as a society in which there would be no difference of views. Uh, that's why the government or even the party or even the political committee could take decisions which would affect everybody. Uh, but that's not how life is and it can ever be. And, and so it's a way of enabling people at different levels to feel that they or their people like them or groups that represent them are involved in a, a real way in um, making the decisions and carrying them out to their and everybody else's in that particular group of, of, of people uh, to, to their benefit, taking account of the fact that if what they do affects other people in a significant way, then they too have to be involved in taking the decision. So it's, if you like, participation. It's not sort of passive democracy. It's active participatory democracy now there is a problem we've come across this that because a close colleague of mine an ex phd student of mine fikret adaman from turkey of whom i've written a lot we've written a lot together but he has been quite influential within turkey in promoting this idea of participation and there have been various studies carried out uh trying to bring together parties in particular areas different interests to see if they can arrive at some sort of agreement. And very often they do arrive at an agreement, but then nothing happens because they don't have the power to ensure that what's agreed is then actually carried out. Um, and so we've decided that there's a danger in certain circumstances, just like there's a danger of greenwash where, you know, oil companies say they're doing something and, but there's also a danger we've decided of participation wash. People feel that they're actually participating, but they're not really participating in a way that makes a real difference to what happens. And that's, if you like, why you could, can't talk about all the things, the ideas um, that, uh, that we've been working on as relevant within a capitalist society. You have to think of ways in which those ideas can be used to promote um, prefigurative actions of one sort or another that would lead further in the direction. And, um, you know, there are plenty of 
examples around of um, people who've thought it similarly. I mean, the other another person I've spent quite a lot of time studying and working on is Karl Polanyi, and um, he has this idea of uh, the, the double movement. Capitalism causes problems, society strikes back and regulates. That causes capitalism to seize up. So you get, say, if you like, the opposite movement to re-establish the market. And it goes on and on like that until society, uh, in the end, takes full control over its economic aspects, which means you have to, in his terminology, get rid of the fictitious commodities, market for capital, labor, and money. Um, so you can move in those directions within capitalism in a prefigurative way, or in ways that then lead to the next stage of demands. But you can't really expect to be able to implement things in, 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 in the way that uh, the model envisages, uh, unless you get rid of capitalism. And one of the ways in which you can help to do that is by this idea of, of moving in that direction through various forms of prefiguration uh, and uh, theoretical and ideological work and so on. Brilliant. That's uh, I absolutely share uh, this uh, analysis 100. Uh, specifically, the the idea that we need prefigurative uh, politics and actions in the here and now, but we do also need formal models of how a democratic uh, participatory plant economy could actually look like. So yeah. let's uh, dive a little deeper into um, how your model is set up. Could you describe the the core elements of your model which you call negotiated coordination well um okay so the first the first building block is is the concept of what i call social ownership not private ownership not state ownership but social ownership and social ownership i think of as as ownership of all the groups that are going to be affected by the use of the assets involved. So if you've got an activity which only affects a small local area, then it could be run by an individual or a small co-op or whatever. If you've got an enterprise which um, covers a, a wider area, then it would need to be owned by the interests within that wider area who are affected. And so it comes back to what I was saying about the climate change, uh, the environmental, the ecological crisis we're facing. There'll be different levels at which decisions have to be taken because different people are affected at different levels. At each of those levels, the people who are the groups that are affected need to be the social owners. So that's the concept of social ownership ownership by the groups of people who are affected by the decisions, by the use of the assets involved. And so that then leads me, because I'm now thinking more in, in terms of economic activity. I mean, you can apply the same principles more generally to political and social activity, but I'm thinking more generally, because after all, I've come at it from the standpoint of an economist or a political economist, I like to think. Um, so then you say to yourself, okay, if you take an industry at the level of the enterprises that constitute that industry or sector of the economy, whatever you want to call it, the people who are going to be affected by the activities of that enterprise are the people who work in it, uh, people who use what it produces, either consumers or other enterprises, if they're intermediate goods that the enterprise produces. Uh, the locality in which the enterprise is based and the people who live there. So just let's take those three, those three groups. Workers in the enterprise, um, users of what the enterprise produces and the locality where the enterprise is based. They would be the social owners in a simplified way of the enterprise you might also want to say well 
we, we might want still to have people who are greens, who are concerned about the way the enterprise will affect the environment and the ecology. And that's the focus of their interest. Similarly, you might want to have groups or associations uh, of people who are concerned with equal opportunities, who would also, if you decided that the enterprise was such that it needed those things or more, they would be part of the uh, group of social owners um, as well. And they would be responsible for the activities of the enterprise using its existing productive capacity. And they would then produce with that productive capacity what they thought uh, was needed. And that would be a, a way of generating information because if consumers or other enterprises didn't want to make use of what they were producing, that would be evident in the fact that they would produce more than they could sell or they would have to uh, lower their prices and then they wouldn't be able to produce as much and so on. So that would be at the level of the enterprise. But then if the size of the industry needed to increase or to shrink, either because increase, because demand for it, what it produced was increasing uh, and so on, it would have to either invest or disinvest. And that would affect all the people who were the social owners of the enterprise. But since there'd be more than typically more than one enterprise in an industry or a sector, other enterprises would be faced with the same problems. Were they going to expand or shrink? And therefore, when it comes to a process of how do you decide on the pattern of investment across all the enterprises in the industry or sector, that doesn't only affect one enterprise, it affects all of them. And therefore they all have to be involved as the social owners of the decisions about investment, major investment in the industry. And therefore what would happen is that you would have a negotiated coordinating body. So they would get together and they would have the information about the performance of individual enterprises, how that what they were producing was being received by the users. Uh, but they would also have information about the work situation in the, in the area where the enterprises were based. Uh, there might be some areas which were suitable only for this type of enterprise uh, and other areas which were suitable for all sorts of different enterprises in which case you'd think, well, the, the, the area that um, was only suitable or the activity that was only suitable for this area is probably the one where activity should expand, investment should be, so that there's work for people in that area to do. Areas where you can easily move from one type of production activity to another, maybe don't need the... Uh, same amount of uh, activity from this industry, they can have activity from other industries. So you'd have to take that into account as well. And you'd arrive then at a decision about the allocation of investment or disinvestment, if this industry was shrinking, um, across the body of enterprises that constituted the um, industry. And if the industry was expanding, you might even need to take account of other areas where the industry wasn't currently based, but maybe there was a shortage of work there or activity there, and this particular activity was suitable there. So you would be able to uh, establish new enterprises in such areas rather than expand existing enterprises. So where you've got interdependent decisions that would affect people in this wider group of areas or this wider group of enterprises, that would have to be taken by negotiation between all the affected groups. So that would be the second sort of strand of it. And that, I noticed in one of your questions, that for, for me is the distinction between market exchange, which is what the individual enterprise engages in and in capitalism how the interdependent 
activities of the different enterprises are coordinated is through the operation of market forces. Profitable enterprises expand, unprofitable enterprises contract or disappear. But that happens in ways that nobody really has any control over. It just happens because if you're making a profit, you can expand, and if you're not, you can't, and you have to contract. So market forces produce uh, outcomes that no one willed. Um, nobody planned them. They just happen as a result of the operation of market forces. Negotiated coordination is an alternative to market forces as a way of coordinating activity. It's also less wasteful because the problem, as, for example, the uh, English economist Morris Dobb emphasised, uh, is that where you've got interdependent decisions to be made, which the outcome of one depends upon what other people are doing as well as what you do, it's better if you can to coordinate those decisions in advance rather than let them be coordinated after the event by the operation of market forces. Now, that also brings us to one of the other questions or points you've made in your um, list of questions, which would be helpful, which was the two different sorts of certainty. So Morris Dobb emphasised that within an economy which is coordinated through the results of market forces operating, one form of uncertainty is created by the fact that you don't know what other enterprises are going to be doing. Whereas what other enterprises are going to be doing will affect the outcome of what you're doing. Uh, so that's one sort of uncertainty. That's, that can be abolished by planning, ex ante planning, planning in advance, rather than ex post coordination after the event. Now, the second sort of uncertainty is uncertainty um, of the sort that uh, Keynes is referred to when he was try trying to draw a distinction between uncertainty and risk. That if you know what the possible outcomes are and what the probability of those outcomes is going to be or is, then you can calculate the risk. But what about things where there's an outcome that nobody knows, but it could happen. You don't even know what it is. So this is what he, he was talking, of course, within a capitalist economy. So he said, nobody knows what the price of copper is going to be in 20 years time. So you can't really plan for that. Um, it's not quite true, you could plan. Anyway, that's a different area we could go into. Um, so, what, what we call ex ante coordination, coordination before the implementation of dis decisions, even though the outcome of each decision depends also on what the other decisions are. Uh, coordination ex ante uh, can be got rid of, uh, can, can get rid of the first sort of uncertainty, but not, of course, the second sort. And for that, then you need contingency planning and all the rest of it. But so, Really, what this would enable would be society at its different levels and within that, people who comprise the societies, having some sort of control over the direction of development of economic activity, what sort of new investment would be needed, what sorts of new industries would be needed, because you also have planning boards at uh, different levels. Um, and it would also mean that people weren't subject to things beyond their control, like, you know, nowadays a factory decides to be, the owners of a factory decide to close it without any consultation of the workers, or maybe they have to negotiate with the workers to avoid a strike or whatever it is, and it may destroy the area. I mean, when the coal mines shut in, this, in the UK, whole areas, whole towns and villages which depended upon the coal mines for their lives. It's structured the whole sort of social, cultural, political activities of the life uh, 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 of the people who live there. 
um, suddenly it all went. And of course, nothing was replaced, replacing it. The idea would be, you know, the neo, the, the market forces idea is that, well, if this activity goes, it means that there'll be unemployment, wages will be down, so new forms of capital will come in, and that it'll all work out in the long run. But it's all very well to talk about the long run, but what about the people who live there in the short run? <laughs> uh, so there we are. I mean, that's, I suppose, basically what I would see uh, the uh, advantage of a participatory planning model based upon uh, social ownership and negotiated coordination. I think it would be great because you already started to, to sketch the institutional framework that you lay out yes. within your book and you started by describing social ownership, what you think this should be like. You described the production units, uh, at least in, in a rough form, and then went on to describe that there will be negotiated coordination bodies, which will coordinate, for example, sectors, depending on the level, so to speak, that needs to be addressed in a, in a given industry, depending on the, the reach of um, how many people in which areas are affected by it. But maybe it would be good to try to complete the, the picture of the institutional setup because you briefly touched upon the fact that there will be planning commissions. But within your model, there is indeed a very kind of concrete idea of how this whole process would actually um, work out and which bodies, institutional bodies, are involved in it. And I think it would be great for the listeners to, to get an idea of the whole process of production units, transferring uh, economic information and meeting within uh, negotiated uh, coordination bodies, which will then uh, transfer the accumulated information, so to speak, to a planning commission. They will develop a plan and, uh, and so on and so on. I think it would be great to kind of sketch the, the rough um, picture of the whole um, process of functioning of the model, so to speak. Yes, well, I suppose, I mean, the way I see it is that you've got this layered structure of decision making and implementation. And each level of the structure operates within a framework that has been set by decisions of the uh, higher levels of decision-making bodies in the structure, the more general levels, put it that way. So for example, if we're talking about a socialist or communist society, we would be talking about a society in which uh, there was no um, unearned income. There would be income for people who couldn't contribute, couldn't work or who were ill or who were young or who were old, of course, but people who are perfectly capable of working wouldn't obtain income by virtue of owning capital or land or whatever you might think about it. Um, so you'd have a set of values in which production for use rather than production for profit would be the value that people had internalized And you'd also have ideas of social human well-being, human flourishing, and what was needed for that. And so there would be certain basic needs that had to be met. And there would be uh, also, one would expect, plenty of uh, time. You could call it free time, if you like, or for time where you weren't actually working, but you might be doing other sorts of things that could count as work if you wanted to think about them like that way you know, time for recreation, for creativity, for artistic activities. You'd also have a system in which the different sorts of work, particularly in this country at the moment, there's a big discussion going on about caring work. And uh, at the moment, people who do caring work, whether within the family or the household, or whether through paid caring work, it's usually seen as rather sort of low-level work, certainly lowly paid compared to all sorts of other things. 
So you'd have a different set of values. Such activities would be valued much more highly than they are in capitalist society. Unless, of course, if you're very rich in capitalist society, you can employ servants and all the rest of it. So I suppose at the, at the most general level, you'd have political discussions. That's why the subtitle of my book was called The Political Economy of a self-governing society. And this self-governing society is not a state that governs, hands things down, but is a self-governing society in a layered structure. And so you'd have, for example, at the highest level, the most general level, you'd obviously have to have legislation to do with, say, human rights, equal treatment, people not being able to be discriminated against, and so on. And that would create a framework within which, at lower levels, you'd have to take account of that. So you couldn't have a situation where, say, a local village or government council decided they didn't want any Roma or gypsy people in. That would not be allowed as a result of the higher level framework that would be uh, established at that level. And so that's the sort of principle that would apply about the relationship between the different levels politically, but also economically, in terms of economic activity. And so you'd, you'd, have, you'd have a political structure, which again would be a layered structure. There'd be an overall probably world, if not government, then at least a world set of institutions which would describe, which would decide on as we've already said, on policies to do with uh, climate change, biodiversity, and so on. And then there you could have regions like the EU, which unfortunately the UK has left, but it could have stayed in and tried to change the things about it that it didn't like in discussion with other people. People who voted to leave are now discovering that what they expected would be great. It then turned out to be a problem. <laughs> However, we don't need to go there. Um, so I think you'd have a, a layered political structure. You'd have a layered economic structure, which would include what you could call planning boards to do with a local area, a city, a region, a country, a set of regions like the EU or the world. I mean, at the moment, for example, it does seem ridiculous that um, we have uh, most of the goods that used to be produced in the developed capitalist countries before deindustrialization are now produced in China or similar, less developed countries and then shipped all the way back, as it were, the technology often comes from the West, but the goods are produced and then shipped for the West to use. So when it comes to CO2 emissions, you can't only take account of these CO2 emissions in producing what you produce in your own country. You have to take account of the CO2 emissions that are produced by other countries on your behalf that are then exported to you. So I would expect, though, of course, people concerned would have to decide at the time when we got there. But I would expect there'd be a move to much more, if you like, local, localised production, which would be then spread more fairly across the world and within a country, across the country, taking account of geographical, climatic, etc. conditions. And I would expect, therefore, to, there to be much less uh, if you like, transportation uh, across the world. But who knows? I mean, that might be wrong. Uh, but that's what I would expect. And uh, But that wouldn't be decided, obviously, by me. That would be decided by the people <laughs> in a democratic, participatory democratic fashion, layered fashion, deciding at the different levels uh, what was best for the people who lived there, for them, and so on. Um, so... You could argue that at the level of the negotiated coordination body, there would not only be, um, it would not only consist of 
the enterprises in the industry or sector, the, the places, the regions where those enterprises were based, other regions that perhaps were underprovided for in terms of economic activity who, and the planning board that would p- put that input into it. So you'd have a structure in a way not, not too different from what um, was planned, say, in the, in the, the national plan in this country, except it was a national plan that um, <laughs> was, existed on paper only. It didn't exist in reality. It's, if you like, at best, within the terminology, you could call it indicative planning. But indicative planning, which has been tried in various capitalist countries, never works, because for it to work, all the people who've got to follow the indications in the different parts of the economy don't necessarily all do it. And so it begins to, that's why the national plan uh, fell apart because it, it envisaged that there would be uh, a certain balance between imports and exports and there wasn't. And so it ran into a balance of payments crisis which had effects on the value of the currency. And so the whole thing collapsed. So you've got to have a system in which decisions are made by the people who are going to be affected by them, and therefore there's more chance of them actually being implemented because they've agreed on them. So it's not a society that I envisage or an economic activity structure that I envisage, which is uh, all predetermined. Its activity is decentralised, but within a centralised framework, if you like. So just to sum up, social ownership, negotiated coordinated bodies, planning boards, all uh, operating in an interdependent way with the planning boards, if you like, representing the political side of things, the government or the authority structure at each level of of the layered structure of decision-making and implementation. I think that's probably the best I can do in terms of the institutional framework. I think we need to try to uh, sketch uh, maybe in an example of how this would work out in concrete terms. Because, I mean, uh, we now have this institutional framework. We have the, the production units. We have the uh, negotiated coordination bodies. We have the planning commissions all on different levels. But how would the concrete like planning and organization of economic production um, work out in concrete terms. So where there, there would be this flow of information as we already uh, kind of touched upon from production units and then this negotiation um, process at the level of the negotiation coordination bodies. And uh, they would then transfer this like then produce collectively produced information to the planning commission but for example at this point maybe could you sketch an image of what this information would entail like what would be the 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 level of precision in terms of information that would be transferred to the planning commission and then so what are the informational inputs that lead into the planning commission what are the processes within the planning commissions you have to say in plural because they are on many different levels what are the processes within these planning commissions with which they try to develop a sensible plan and what are the parameters along which this process uh, tries to figure out what is seen as sensible and what is not because there are different elements to this there are political elements to this there are um, elements of like mere efficiency so to speak and and so i would be interested in how this would go along uh, in order to at the end produce a plan that is both sensible in terms of um, not wasting um, resources unnecessarily and also able to lead to a consensus about the implementation of uh, this given plan because these are both like difficult um, goals to, to achieve actually, I would say. Well, I suppose the first thing I'd say in response to that is that 
you talked about information flowing up through the different levels to inform what happens at each level. And that is undoubtedly one of the central processes that I would envisage. But equally, what you did mention, which I think is, is as important, is that there would also be information flowing down so that the decisions that the enterprise makes are partly dependent on the framework set by the decisions made by the negotiated coordination bodies. And their decisions are likewise partially shaped by the information coming down from the planning commission. So there's, if you like, an interactive flow of information between the different levels, which is, one would hope, what would enable the different levels of decision-making, the different bodies, to make the most effective use of the available information, the relevant information coming from lots of different sources. So I've already said that one source of information would be the performance of the enterprise, each enterprise, in terms of what it's producing is if it re received by its potential users. So you could have a situation in which the enterprise is producing more than its users want to use, whether they're consumers or other enterprises using intermediate goods. Equally, uh, if that's the case, then that what they do would be to either they'd have to build up stocks, inventories, the enterprise is producing, they wouldn't be selling everything. Or um, if they weren't producing enough, then they would have order books, which weren't being fulfilled as rapidly as they would like to fill them. That would suggest that either the enterprise needs to expand or contract, depending upon whether it's producing too much or too little. But then that's one, that's one source of information uh, that would be relevant to the negotiated coordination body, which would be um, interested in, if you like, the extent to which the resources organised within the enterprise were being used in a way that contributed to what people wanted. Then, of course, what people wanted if we're talking about consumers, would be very different from what people want in a capitalist country where capitalism generates discontent. You, it's not just that you want more, but you also always want different things uh, because, you know, everything's rapidly made obsolete, fashion changes, and all the rest of it. So sort of turbo consumerism wouldn't exist. And what would you be interested in would be what contributes to human flourishing. Uh, human needs. And therefore, when you were considering how to, at, at say, the level of the negotiated coordinating body, when you're considering what to do about the pattern of investment for the industry or sector that you're trying to work out, you'd have to take account on the one hand of how the individual enterprises were doing. On the other hand, you'd have to take account of what the situation within the localities in which the enterprises were based, what the situation there was, was there a shortage of work, was there too much work, et cetera, et cetera. You'd also have to take account of information that the negotiating or board coordination body got from the uh, planning board, which was to say, well, at the political level, it's been decided that we need to prioritise this form of development. We need to prioritise, for example, um, a shorter working week. So you'd have to take account of that uh, in terms of how you were going to operate. Then in terms of what well, we've already talked about, uh, climate change would affect the nature of the technology that you might have to move to or to install. So it's, I don't know that one can do more, at least I can do more, than just say, well, there'd be a lot of different sources of information coming from a lot of different groups who are likely to be differently affected by the decisions taken. And 
this information, because the groups themselves are participating in the discussions, is information which the groups themselves would be able to contribute to the discussion based upon their own experience, their own situation, which nobody else knows quite in the same way that they do. In other words, if I wanted to use technical terms, uh, they would be able to draw on the, the social tacit knowledge of the group. Um, one of the things that the Austrians are always on about, or at least the modern Austrians, uh, a tacit knowledge. It used to be distributed knowledge, but since Oscar Langer's model solved that problem, they now have fallen back on tacit knowledge. But when they think of tacit knowledge as individual knowledge, whereas, of course, you can have the tacit knowledge of a group, learns how to work together, uh, and so on. So the tacit knowledge of the different interests, groups representing the different interests, would be contributed. And therefore, you'd have a situation in which there would be discussion about what to, what to do, what decisions to make, based upon a consideration of all these different forms of knowledge that are relevant. And it would take place in a group of people whose psychological predisposition, whose values were, well, look, we're obviously concerned about how this is going to affect us, but we also are concerned about it's, how it's going to affect other people. And therefore, we've got to come to an agreement about um, what the best outcome, not for everybody individually, but for the social owners as a whole, would be. So it's an extension of, of John Donne's No Man is an Island. No group is an individual group, and all it cares about is itself. It's part of a collectivity, and it's concerned with the well-being of the collectivity. And the collectivity includes people who are going to be differently affected by the decision. Some decisions will affect everybody adversely, but there's unlikely to be a decision that will affect everybody beneficially without, if they didn't have to take account of other people. So there'd have to be a process of discussion, negotiation, um, and, you know, in a way, again, from my own experience, I've had a very sort of minor, uh, very minor indeed, example of this in, in the university, um, which has a limited budget. Uh, most universities don't have a large enough budget, but leave that aside. So you've got the different departments, the different faculties. They all want more resources. And they have a resource committee and they have representatives from the different departments and faculties on this committee. And they argue and negotiate about how cuts or increases should be distributed. And in the end, they reach an agreement. Not everybody's happy with the agreement because they'd like more, but they'll live with it. And of course, you could say, well, supposing somebody says we won't live with it. Well, that's not how, that's not the ethos of the sorts of discussion, sorts of negotiation that um, we're envisaging if we're talking about a, a socialist stroke communist society. Uh, we're talking about a society in which people's well being depends as much on other people's well being being catered for as on their own well being catered for solidarity if you like so you know, obviously you're right you, there'd have to be you know it might be democratic uh, dis decision voting in a negotiated coordination body there might be different ways there might be sort of um, weighted votes for the different groups if it was decided that some groups were more affected than others it might be with reserve levels of decisions percentages of voting depending upon uh, so a variety of different ways would be evolved. And I don't think um, in advance one can do more than sketch out these, at least I can do more, than sketch out these general uh, principles. And it would be a learning process through which uh, people would learn about the interests of other people. It wouldn't be a process of 
preference aggregation because in the course of the discussions, the negotiations, people's preferences would change. So by participating in this process, you change yourself, not just other people. I think there are uh, some some uh, elephants in the room that, that need to be addressed. And, and I guess one of them would be the question of complexity. Because uh, complexity, complexity, yes. Yeah. I mean, in uh, in a, in a very abstract and general sense, I absolutely understand where you're coming from and the idea of what you said in in your last sentence that it is not only about a collection of existing preferences, but uh, about a like a collective production of a, a shared interest, so to speak, and and then the 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 will and the ability to act upon it, maybe to add. Um, I, I absolutely share this, but still, I mean, uh, if if we live in societies that have a degree of complexity that we do have right now, and I think they are absolutely. Um, Uh, great benefits to this kind of complexity um, uh, as well as dangers, of course, but still. So it's not about getting back to a situation where everything is only produced on a local level where people kind of argue face to face uh, um, how, uh, what and when things are being done. But we have a, a degree of complexity and um Uh, that that needs definitely needs different kinds of processes in order to bring about for example also complex products if you take a computer and uh, then uh, some uh, production unit would have to like address all of the different layers all of the different people all of the different areas that are in one way or another affected by producing a computer then this explodes the amount of people that are that would have to be involved in in the decisions leading up to the final um computer <laughs> that we can use and and work on because i mean we have rare minerals we have all sorts of materials that are produced in different areas of the world etc cetera, etc cetera. and about many of the the ways in which these things could be produced there will be conflict there will be different ideas of how things are being done and and so on and so on so i guess the elephant in the room would then be if we have this principle of social ownership if we have this principle of everybody who is in one way or another being affected then you would immediately run into very concrete problems in terms of how to actually produce um, for example a com complex uh, product such a, such as a a computer so maybe you could like run us through the the idea of how these questions could be addressed within your framework well i think i think this is a um if you like a variation on uh, oscar wilde's objection not objection but witty comment on whether socialism would work, too many meetings. So I think it's a variation of that. But the point is that, well, I'd make two points here. Well, three, actually. Um, the idea that everybody would have to be involved in every decision, because everybody in some sense, however remotely, is affected by every decision, uh, is not anything that, not, not anything like what I envisage. I envisage, and I think the model envisages, uh, that people are involved either directly or indirectly, either face-to-face, -face, as you put it, or via representatives in major decisions that affect them. Um, so, for example, it could argue that within an enterprise, If the workforce comes across a better way of doing things than had previously been the case, and that required a bit of new equipment or something, which you could call investment, minor investment like that would be within the scope of the enterprise to do. If it came to major investment, like a, um, a whole new factory, 
or workshop, then that would have to be considered in terms of, well, does this count of something which would affect other people to some extent, uh, to, to such an extent that they need to be involved in the decision or not? And you could only work that out, I think, really, as things evolve. I mean, I could fall back upon um, the uh, generally accepted view that that Marx and Engels didn't say much about how a future socialist society should would work, because that would have to be worked out by the people who were doing it, who were there, who were implementing it. Uh, but in general, you can have the principles. And um, so I think my first sort of comment on that would be that um, it wouldn't be a situation where everybody had to be involved in everything, even if it everybody is thought of as everybody who might have at some level some small input into uh, the decision at some time or other. So, I mean, at the moment, you talk about a computer. Well, now, and the complexity of everything that goes into that, obviously true. Scientific endeavour, a lot of international cooperation, maybe not as much as they should be, but because of you know, private property rights and all the rest of it. But still, uh, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot. I mean, one of the problems that we're experiencing in the UK now, having left the EU, is the extent to which we're still going to be involved in EU activities, scientific activities. And surprise, surprise, they discover, well, if you're not in the EU, you uh, don't actually have the same right to be involved as if you were in the EU. What a surprise. Anyway, that's something else. So that's the first thing I'd say, that these things happen at the moment without everybody feeling they have to be involved in everything. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, at the moment, uh, in in capitalist societies, you get a variety of institutional forms. So, for example, you get uh, the multinational firm, which has a headquarters somewhere, then has branches, and there are different models. One model is not that similar to the distinction between market exchange and uh, negotiated coordination over investment, where the different branches of an enterprise submit their profits to a centre, and the centre decides what to do with them, how to allocate them to, to this branch or to close that branch or open another branch. So... Is these sorts of things already happen uh, to a significant extent. And, um, of course, if you've got a conflictual relationship like you do under capitalism, workers, even managers, in one branch is being closed, might not be happy. Uh, but nevertheless, if they're not involved in the process of decision-making, either directly or indirectly, what can they... Um, you know, there's not, not much they can do about it other than go on strike or work slow or, and in the end, that will probably cause the enterprise to shut. The other thing to say, two other things to say, one is that um, actually, uh, if you think about the way in which complex capitalist societies work, they work almost exclusively based upon meetings There are meetings of boards of directors. There are meetings of technical teams. There are meetings of human relations. Used to be called personnel. Now we're not personnel, we're not people anymore. We're just resources. Um, So one shouldn't underestimate the number of meetings that take place to run complex capitalist society. One shouldn't also underestimate the extent to which a lot of those meetings are to do with how to deal with getting round regulations, capitalist rivalry, protecting uh, intellectual property, fighting legal battles, all of which you'd expect would more or less disappear in a socialist so communist society. So, and then the third thing I'd like to say about that is that at the moment, 
we don't only have a functional division of labor, which you'll always need. Uh, that is to say, you have electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, etc. You have electricians, you have plumbers. Uh, so you have a functional division of labor. You also have accountants, managers, technicians. Uh, you also have uh, doctors, um, lawyers, uh, architects. So you've got a functional division of labor, but you've also got a social division of labor. That is to say, most people spend most of their time doing work of the same functional level. So skilled manual workers, professional workers, uh, managers who run things, politicians. Most people spend most of their time doing those sorts of works. It's a bit like, you know, in the university, you don't only have um, academics, uh, but you also have people who clean the rooms and the corridors. And most academics don't clean the rooms and the corridors. Uh, and most people who clean the offices and the floors aren't academics. So there, there are these different social divisions. And it's been found, I think it would be fair to say, that people who are the same social level of division of labor, even though functionally they're doing different things, find it much easier to talk to one another than they do to talk to people who are in a different social level. Now, if you, as I propose in my book, think of that it way, that way, what I would envisage, what, what I argue for, is that we abolish the social division of labor, which is basically what um, Marx talked about the difference between intellectual and manual work generalized to the different sorts of social division of labor. And we each at various stages in our lives or possibly at the same stage in our life do different sorts of labor, which is currently now what is social division of labor divided. So for example, you get this process of, um, you get, in, in military terms, you had national service where all young people, usually young men, had to join the, uh, the national service. There has been proposals, what some people call shit work, uh, that is to say, you know, emptying dustbins or sweeping streets or digging ditches or whatever it is. It's something that actually uh, you could have as a sort of social service and that could be done by, uh, you know, young people the necessary work that still remained after you went for as much mechanization and automation and so on as you can have. Uh, and you could actually probably envisage, I mean, I did national service in the Royal Air Force in the UK, and although I wouldn't have had to spend my whole life doing it, it was quite an interesting experience. And, you know, you learned something, it was boring. I wouldn't have wanted to, to spend most of my time doing it. But I was young and uh, you get through it. And there's a certain camaraderie develops, which you enjoy at that age and so on. But then, you know, I'm perfectly capable of cleaning my own office, but that's not how things are structured. So if, if we all did our fair share, give or take a bit, of um, the different social levels of activity, social division of labor, rather than functional division of labor, we'd have experience of all these different levels. And it means, for example, that if we were involved, as for example, in the university, to some extent, where in the governing bodies of the university, uh, people were mainly appointed, uh, but there were one or two, there was a small proportion of elected members. And if you were elected and you were got, got involved in the decisions involved in running a university, you learnt what was involved, what mattered. And then when you stopped being elected, because we were usually elected by the, because we were the sort of representatives of the union who would put themselves forward for election and usually got elected. 
Uh, but you began to appreciate the problems that the management, if you like, was dealing with. And you didn't necessarily always agree with the decisions they made, but you could see that there were decisions that needed to be made that weren't easy decisions. And if you've had experience of that, it means that you approach it in a slightly different way. You're not always oppositional and say, no, we're not having that. You've got to think of something that, what would you put forward as a way of dealing with the problem that would actually move things forward in the direction that you would like to see it go rather than just no, no, no to everything. Um, so it would mean that if you, if you did that, there'd be less of a problem in terms of dealing with the complexity that you're talking about. And uh, the fact that I think that this is just what I think, I've no idea whether this would be the case or not, that uh, there'd be more, as it were, production would be more localised. Not everything, of course, but more localised. So things that could be produced locally probably would be produced locally rather than being shipped across the world because it could be produced slightly more cheaply there since you pay people less there and so on. You'd get rid of all that. Um, and I don't actually see complexity as a problem, really. It's, it's something that, that obviously exists in modern society and will exist in all societies, but I don't see why it can't be dealt with by people having, as it were, been transformed by, I mean, one argument that sometimes is, 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 uh, is used against participation is, well, maybe lots of people don't want to participate or maybe they're not able to participate. But the point is that if you have never had the chance of participating in running anything, then you probably don't want to get involved in it. A bit like participation wash. If what you do makes no difference, why bother? And so people learn by, by, what they, by their life experience. And if they have life experience of different sorts, then they have a, a wider basis of experience to draw upon when thinking about things. Now, this probably doesn't dispose of your elephant, but I think um, it uh, is, is that's how I think about it anyway. Well, it doesn't completely uh, dissolve uh, the, the the problem, I'd, I'd say. So there's still some kind of elephant uh, there, I'd say. And this is not because I wouldn't share like most of your arguments. I just uh, think that that they even taken together do not yet address like the complexity of the problem itself because i mean at the end one like essential question would be how to draw the line if you say that okay not everybody has to be involved in everything and being like affected in a tiny bit by something does not really immediately lead to uh, the necessity of you being involved in the process, then, I mean, the, immediately the, the question comes up, okay, but what is the parameter or what is the, what is the, the way in which this distinction is being made? Because if we stick to the example of a computer, then despite the, the fact that we do have a lot of meetings in capitalism as well and all the arguments that you just gave, there still at the end is the very concrete question that if the principle in general is that if you're uh, affected by some of the elements that are um, involved in the production of a computer, then you will have to be involved within the uh, process as such, then the problem still exists if we do not like have some kind of um, uh, idea of uh, how to define this threshold, so to speak, of how much being affected leads to one necessarily being involved within a, um, a process or a decision-making process uh, uh, and stuff like that. And the question then is if there are like 30 different interests being represented within the board of a given production unit, then how to argue that the 31st should then not be included? Or, I mean, there, there needs to be some kind of... Um, principle to, to, to draw a line of when something counts as being 
affect it because I'm, it's just a, a very like a, a question of principles as much as practice, you know? Well, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to say about that. I mean, at the moment, you've described the complexity of the inputs into making a computer. Okay, I, obviously that's the case. Now, I suppose I would see that as a lower level decision than the decision as to whether or not one wants to have a computer made in the first place. So there's been a lot of work done, less fashionable now than it used to be sometime, about the way in which technical progress, although it can't be um, predicted in advance, the form it's going to take, but the direction in which it goes is shaped by the dominant interests in the society. So, for example, there's a lot of discussion now about social media or YouTube or whatever. Now, some people argue that these technologies are um, technologies that just develop almost independently neutrally they're just technologies that's there to be sort of discovered or created or whatever rather than the alternative view is that these technologies are developed in ways that, that suit or contribute to the existing ethos the existing uh, ways of things happening under uh, capitalism uh, so i think at, at that level uh, there would be decisions about the direction in which one wanted technology to go. Not the detail, because one can't predict that, but the direction in which one wants to go. Where does one want to put resources for future technological developments? Which teams of the sort that you're talking about does one want to support? And presumably, big companies do that all the time. They have to decide, uh, are they going to favour this technique or that technique? or this direction of development, or that direction of development. Once that decision has been made, and the resources to finance it have been made available, then it's not up to the people who are making those decisions to actually implement it. It's up to the people who know about the structure. So that's where, I mean, at a, at a simple level, social owners would decide just as the boards of directors do of private capitalist companies now, overall sort of priorities for the, for the company or for the uh, enterprise. But then it would be the people who work in the enterprise who would be the ones who say, okay, this is what we need to be doing. This is what we need to be going. How are we going to do that? How, and, and then if they then come up with ideas for something new, they can put that. So you get two-way flow of information. And that doesn't mean to say you wouldn't have specialist teams like the sort that you're talking about. And of course, at one level, you know, if the butterfly stamps here, somebody dies across the other side of the world. But I mean, that sort of degree of involvement is not the sort of uh, involvement that I have in mind, maybe wrongly, when it comes to thinking about social ownership. I think of it as it were major categories of interests like consumers or workers and when it comes to workers i mean i would and i do in my book say well it's of course the main pre people who are going to be affected in implementing something are the workers in the enterprise concerned once the overall decisions by the social owners at the if you like board of directors or whatever uh, level uh, Has, has reached their decisions. But then it's up to the workers in the enterprise to, to, to see how they can be best implemented. But in a sense, it's not just up to the workers in that enterprise, because the workers in the enterprise might say, well, you know, we, we want to um, make sure that this thing that we're working on is going to take off, and therefore we will cut wages by 20% so that it can be sold more cheaply. Now, that would then have an effect on other workers. And therefore, as well as the workers in the enterprise itself being represented as part of the social owners, 
you probably, in a more minor way, have, say, trade unions represented so that they could say, come on, you can't just cut workers. That would be setting up wages. You can't be setting a precedent for everywhere else. We can't do that. And so they'd argue the case. So in other words, I always have found it difficult to go beyond the general principles because I think that would have to be learnt by doing um, rather than prescribed in advance. Um, I think the general principles I'm fairly clear on, and you seem to be happy with them too, but how <laughs> they'd actually work out in practice, in detail, I can't, I can't foretell that. That would have to be worked out by the people who are doing it. Yeah, I guess I'm. I, my my position would be that I think there are still some open questions in terms of the general principles as well, uh, because they cannot that easily be separated from the practical implementation. That would be one point, I guess. And I mean, that's where, for example, uh, modern information and communication technologies come into play, or the question of. Um, formalizing a bit more how people would actually be involved, what kind of decision-making processes would be implemented in order to still provide this um, absolutely understandable benefit of having people that are affected by something being able to participate within the process, which I totally agree with, but still uh, doing it in a way that kind of is aware of the practical implementation of the whole process as such and um, I mean uh, one one thing that as I said immediately immediately pops up would be the question of how could like modern information and communication technologies maybe assist within this process because uh, this in a world which is like highly diverse highly interconnected and in which some processes of production are necessarily international and not local This um, kind of needs to be addressed in some way, shape or form, I would say. And um, yeah, I mean, that's something I am absolutely interested in, the question of how could this maybe be technologically mediated in a meaningful way, not in a way which kind of eliminates the, the essential features of the thing, but assists with the handling of, of complexity when it comes to this um yeah you you addressed it as too many meetings problem and i do understand some of the arguments that you give uh, against it but still there is a rest of um open questions when it comes to the question of complexity and and i'm yeah i'm asking myself how to how to as i said kind of uh, maybe try to mediate it in a technological way that, that is really meaningful and not um, like stupidly deterministic, so to speak. <laughs> well, I think we'd probably have to leave this issue there because uh, uh, I can see, well, I mean, first of all, in terms of in international, the fact that I envisage um, production being much more localized than it currently is, doesn't mean to say I don't envisage there being some international exchange, trade, and so on. So it's not complete autarky I'm talking about at all. And then the only other thing to say, which I've already said, is that within the sort of broad uh, frameworks that are determined at a higher level, at a lower level, um, it's the people who are actually involved in doing it who would have to work things out. And within that, I mean, I not myself had an experience of that, but I imagine that if you uh, decided to, to, to make a computer in this way rather than that way, that would affect some people more than others because some people would have the skills for this way, but not for that way. And, uh, you know, it, and it may be that people, like you're talking about communication and so on, you know, that, that people have inputs into a process that they can put in from a distance. And so, I mean, all, all that seems to me to be uh, the level of, of detailed implementation rather than the uh, overall framework and set of principles that one wants to apply. So, of course, in some sense, almost every decision anybody makes 
will have some impact on other people. So it's a, a it's a way of as it were, on the one hand, deciding on the the, the major minor groups that are going to be affected or individuals that are going to be affected at a lower level. And on the other hand, uh, recognizing that I don't think we can predict in advance how these things are going to be resolved other than to draw upon the undoubted sort of experience of technology under capitalism that uh, happened as a result of people cooperating and skills and so on. But, you know, we could go back to Lenin, who we may remember said that socialism uh, can be built through Soviets on the one hand and electrification on the other. Uh, <laughs> but he wasn't concerned about the details of the electrification. He was just concerned about the fact that what it did was provide a source of energy that could then be used. Um, so but anyway, that's an aside. I mean, I hope it's all right if I, I have some uh, pressing questions that we hopefully can cover, even though I already have taken up a lot of your time. Be no, no, it's absolutely fine. Okay, okay. Because, I mean, there are some uh, some very general questions concerning your model that I do have as well, because you um, kind of uh, said, all right, the, the details, they will have to be produced, evolved, negotiated uh, within the process, which I do understand, even though... As I said, I have some uh, some uh, elephants. Um, uh, my some of my elephants might might be bigger than you, than yours, but I have to. I have some general questions as well, and one of those is addressing the kind of implicit anthropology, so to speak, uh, that your uh, model holds. I kind of labeled it homo negotiatus and homo activus. You did, yes. <laughs> Because, I mean, <laughs> there, there is this this specific uh, idea, this specific image that your model relies on heavily, and that is the image of, and I quote you here, self-activating, self-determining individuals, end quote. And uh, these uh, self-activating, self-determining uh, individuals should have control over their lives. And this image, this uh, it has a quite humanistic ring to it, I would say, and a strong belief into uh, reason as the foundational and guiding principle of not only the political, but also the, the economic structures. And this is kind of, at least that was my impression, uh, the, the point where the pluralism that you promote, the pluralism of your model actually collapses because uh, since the whole thing is based upon the idea of everybody being involved, everybody would have to somewhat commit to this ideal and uh, not only commit to it actually, but also incorporate it into the deepest levels of one's personality. And I was uh, asking myself if there isn't um, some kind of essentialism at play here in which it is assumed that what everybody truly wants is to actively participate in all of this and uh, to be this specific type of person. And during our uh, interview, you already mentioned that there is, of course, this aspect of division of labor. And if this is overcome, then we would be able to learn different ways of approaching different kinds of skills, different kinds of labors, etc. And that this would also lead to a kind of um, development, also an internal development. And I do understand that point, and I think it's very valid. But I doubt that this addresses the underlying universalism um, within the assumption that given this development, at the end, everybody would want to participate and want to be this specific homo sapiens that you imagine um, as a basis for your model? I mean, I think you put it in the question, something like the tension between interdependence and autonomy. And I just don't see that they are incompatible. I don't, I think no man is an island. Um, No person is an island. And um, we are shaped by our interaction with other people, by our social experience through our lives. And the idea that there is some essentialist 
characteristics of Homo sapiens is um, it depends how you interpret that. I mean, my partner is a, a developmental psychologist and a linguist, and she um, has this very interesting issue associated with Chomsky, which on the one hand, he's got his sort of politics, broadly speaking, with which we agree. But on the other hand, in terms of language, he, he, his view apparently, I mean, I'm no expert on this, his view apparently is that um, language is, is innately pre-wired. So it's part of the essential makeup of human beings, which is why all language, although it takes different forms, is basically the same and has the same structure. And it's, it's independent of the input. It's just there. And different inputs cause it to come out in different ways, but nevertheless, it's there. So this is a sort of innatist view of language. Now, the other way of thinking about it, which is the one that my partner belongs to, is that, um, of course, nobody would deny that there is an innate capacity for human beings to learn language in a way that no other species has learned it. So that's not just by accident, it's because things have evolved to make that possible. So in that sense, language is in that innate, but the form it takes depends upon the input that people hear. And that shapes, and that's why you've got very, very different forms of language. And the, the, the debate between the two schools, of course, is between, you know, one school saying, well, yeah, yeah, but you can always interpret your findings of listening to what, how children learn to talk and so on uh, in your way, but we can interpret it in our way. And that's how it goes. So I think that it's a sort of false opposition to talk about autonomy and interdependence uh, as being incompatible. I think that um, whether we like it or not, we are all inter interdependent. And I actually do quite like it. I mean, I wouldn't like to be a hermit and be totally isolated, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, it's really that there, there are forms of interdependence which are usually oppressive and alienating and there are forms of interdependence which are liberating and humanizing. And so I don't really see that it's, it's a real problem, the way you've put it. If people haven't had the chance of interdependent activity in which they feel that what they're doing makes a difference, as I said before, they'll think, well, what's the point? Um, and if they don't have to do it all, the li all their lives because you don't have this um, social division of labour, so you can move from one thing to another, from, you can move from being, a, uh, as many people in our society do, being a professional to being a manager and sometimes then to being a capitalist. But the other form of interdependence is the interdependence of the working class movement, the labour movement, which is solidarity, support, cooperation. And uh, I think those two forms, if you like, are learnt through the experience you go through and the circumstances you find yourselves in. So I don't really think that is a problem as I see it. I, I go back to um, Marx's distinction, again, in the critique of the Goethe programme, between what he calls the lower and the higher stages of communism, with the lower stage having been, having come to be called socialism, and the higher stage communism. Uh, but he talks about the lower and the higher stages of communism. And his point is that the lower stage of communism, i.e. after you get rid of capitalism and you move to a socialist, as opposed to a communist society, which he describes as uh, from each according to ability, 
So you contribute what you can to each according to work. So you're rewarded in terms of how much you put in to the collective well-being. And that is because uh, he thinks that at that stage, on the one hand, productivity hasn't reached the stage where there's enough to produce an equal amount for everything, for everybody who needs it. So, but the other point about that is that when we move from capitalism to post-capitalism, we, we are shaped by our experience of capitalism and all the prejudices, ways of thinking and so on and so forth that we take with us have been shaped by that form of society. And so socialism or the lower stage of communism, as he puts it, is a process of on the one hand, making sure that there's the ability to produce enough to satisfy needs. And on the other hand, the slogan is from each according to ability, we all do what we can, we put into the collective uh, pot. But we get not what we put in, the equivalent of what we put in, but what we need. So from each according to ability to each according to need. And need then depends upon, well, what counts as what you need to contribute to human flourishing. And much of what is consumed and people think they need under um, capitalism, probably most uh, increasingly people would agree doesn't actually contribute to human flourishing. So, you know, there's a problem of obesity. Uh, there's a problem of the sales where shops say there's one big prize that you can get at half price but there's only one. So people queue up in advance, uh, sometimes for days, in hope of getting this one prize. And only one person can get it. And the thousands of others have been queuing up, don't get it. So they, they, they feel they've lost out, they're discontented. Capitalism generates discontent. So you've got to, you've got to contribute to, you, you've got to think about what used to be, perhaps still is called abundance, enough to satisfy everybody's needs, not just in terms of how much can be produced, but also in terms of how much counts or what counts as contributing to human well-being, what counts as needs. And so from that way, I, I think that some people may choose not to want to participate, but they've got to have the opportunity and the encouragement and the experience to enable them to do so if they would like to. And I don't see any reason why people wouldn't want to be involved in um, taking decisions that have major effects on their lives. But who knows? But that's a learning process. I mean, we'll discover that by what happens. You touched upon many um, different things that I would like to uh, follow up on. Uh, the first thing would be a, a clarification. I absolutely agree that the dichotomy of interdependence on, on the one hand and individual autonomy on the other hand, I do not share this as well. It's, uh, that was not the, the point that I was getting at with my question before. It was more addressed towards what you uh, said uh, at the end of your answer. And this kind of touches upon the question of compulsion to work as well, because at the end you said, okay, some people might not choose to participate and this could mean participate in the process of uh, dem democratically negotiating the goals of one's uh, society or uh, mode of production or whatever but it might also uh, include choosing not to work at all and and this uh, is another question that i have concerning your model because at some point within uh, our talk today you mentioned that um that there is no unearned income and you directed it towards people who might profit from uh, private capital. But there is also the question of whether there is or is not some form of universal basic income uh, additional to what I assume to be uh, unconditional basic services that provide uh, 
base amount of infrastructure for everybody, which I definitely see included in your thinking and the way you sketch your model. But apart from that, you seem to think that it is a necessary component of, of this type of model that people are kind of, quote-unquote, forced to work uh, through, through this trade-off of working and then receiving some kind of um, remuneration. Because this is kind of connected to the question that I had before when it comes to whether or not there is some idea of um, universal um, like expectation towards the individuals to be this specific type of human, you know, this specific type of human that is self-reflective, active, engaged, participating and stuff like that, you know. This is kind of the, the ground material of your model and you build your institutions, the, the whole setup around this idea of how the individual human sees itself in relation to others, in relation to oneself and stuff like that. But I would argue, as you touched upon briefly in your last answer, that many people might function very differently, you know. They, they might not fit into this idea of uh, active subject, active individual and stuff like that. And I would argue that there is a benefit in this as well. And that they, and this is like the long uh, circle I'm, I'm kind of making, connecting these two questions. And I would argue this leads us into an area where there should not be some kind of first phase to uh, second phase kind of distinction where in the first phase the 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 work is connected to some kind of wage and that you necessarily are quote unquote forced to work um, in order to get some kind of um, existence beyond basic 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 needs i'm not sure if this was uh, understandable at all the question <laughs> no i mean i think I would see that there would be a general expectation that people should contribute to the collective well-being of society, which includes themselves and other people, by taking part in economic activity which creates the things that people need to flourish as human beings. And so I think that this does connect to the idea that we can't really go that far in thinking about how human beings might become if they lived in a completely different sort of society. I mean, you know, anthropologists have looked at uh, whether there ever was a society based upon what Marx and Engels called primitive communism, where there was a subsistence society. It produced to use itself, not to sell. And its expectations were, as to what was possible were formed by what was possible, given it was subsistence. So that was their expectations. Uh, now, in a complex society, like any modern society, what people need, it partly depends upon how those needs are shaped, as I've already said, but it also depends on their different circumstances. And I think in any civilized society, you wouldn't have a situation where large numbers of children go hungry. So you'd have to have a situation where families were able to um, access enough and therefore command enough resources to look up, make sure that children flourish and similarly old people and, and ill people without themselves in any given moment contributing to uh, society. So that's why people have pensions. Uh, they're no longer contributing to society, but they have contributed to society in the past. So what I think you're talking about is supposing there are people who say, no, I'd just rather lie on a beach all day and not do any work to contribute to anything. Now, okay, 
I mean, there might be such people, but I think it's very unlikely, given uh, social norms that would prevail and so on. You might say, well, I want to, um, as you said yourself, I, you want to do these interviews and you wouldn't want anybody else to tell you uh, who to interview and who not. Fine, why not? I don't think my model would have any problems with that, so long as you didn't necessarily feel that you had to, in order to obtain what you needed to survive in the way that you wanted to survive, you didn't feel that if you couldn't do that from your interviews, then you'd get it from somewhere else. So you'd have to, there'd have to be a way of thinking, well, if people want to do, well, first of all, there would be a lot more spare time, so you could do it in your spare time. Secondly, you wouldn't have to have anybody telling you what to do. If you want to do it, you do it. You know, if you need resources, well, you can get hold of those resources. You know about technology. You could get hold of computers and all the rest of it. You'd have to have the wherewithal to do that, of course. And uh, but if you, in your spare time, were contributing to in one way or another, I mean, you know, there, there used to be there still is this organisation called Wages for Housework because housework is contributing to the collective well-being. It's not properly shared between typically men and women over at the moment, but never mind. If it were shared, it would obviously count as a socially necessary activity. And all sorts of things like you're doing might well count similarly. So I don't think there's any, any real problem about that. I think there would be a problem in the sense that uh, there might be a, a sort of form of um, social disapproval if somebody chose um, to lie on a beach all day, but not if they were doing some creative fact that contributed in one way or another to human well-being and not just their own. So we could use the term that uh, is sometimes used uh, about, say, um, well, in the UK, members of the royal family, which is that they're parasites because they don't do anything useful, uh, and yet they live in luxury. Now, not everybody would agree with that because some people think they do do something useful, uh, that they, uh, you know, they have a figurehead and the Queen is very popular and she's supposed to hold things together and so on. All, all OK, fine, if people think that. But... What I'm trying to get at is if people are doing something, if choose to do something that is actually, let's call it parasitic on what other people do and what they depend upon is what other people produce in order for them to depend upon it. Well, you know, there may be such people. I think it's unlikely that there'd be many people who felt like that in a different form of society with a different set of values. So I think my view about, about that would be there would be, on the one hand, basic services, which would, everybody could have access to, and which people would be um, able just about to live on at a sort of not in poverty. But, uh, but otherwise, if they wanted more than that, then they would probably have to have some accounting system to say, well, we are contributing something. And there'd have to be a collective uh, social political decision uh, different levels of the society about well what to what what is allowed to be counted as that and what isn't uh, so people who want to spend their time as artists why not uh, that does contribute to human well-being people who want to spend their time I don't know as I've said just for the sake of not being able to think of anything else sort of lie on a beach all day well okay if they want to do that fine but they, they shouldn't really expect to uh, have more, if you like, than the basic necessities for living a decent life. I mean, I think these things would all have to be worked out, and it's very difficult to come to any answer other than I would expect the norm would be, I may be wrong, of course, but I would expect the norm to be that people would feel uh, that they needed to and possibly even wanted to make a contribution to the collective well-being of society, including themselves. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think we, we, uh, there's a, a, like 
deep level misunderstanding going on here because I'm uh, I absolutely um, agree with this. You know, I'm I, I I'm absolutely not at all <laughs> on the side of um, of those who who try to sketch such a society as uh, like uh, a problem of some people being parasitic or anything as such. I'm absolutely not on this side. I'm, I'm at the opposite side. I would argue for a decoupling of, you know, very good living standards for everybody and the, uh, and the question of work. Because I absolutely agree that um, most people would be prone to do stuff and to be helpful and to bring uh, some knowledge, some skill into the reproduction of, uh, of society as a whole. So I absolutely agree with that. The thing is that coming from this place of actually pushing it even further you know uh, i do think that the that the the heavy reliance on um on a specific idea of um like self-activating and self-determining um, um individual that this might That, that we that we actually would need a plurality on, on uh, of perspectives on humans as such within this category as well because I do and that was kind of the the thing I was heading at is that I do value people who are not active as well <laughs> you know because I think that they might have that they they might bring in different skills that uh, there's a there's a value to passiveness as well because people who are not like this self-activating like uh, individual that is always self-conscious and and reflective and and rational quote unquote this is a very specific idea of what a human being might be and i think there there's a whole plethora of different ways of um like um like seeing oneself and acting oneself, et cetera, that is very, very, very much valuable as well. Yeah, I, I'm still not sure I've completely grasped your, your position because mm -hmm. um, I think that, I think in the, in, the, in the sort of society that I have in mind, there would be plenty of space and time for people as as individuals or maybe as small groups of individuals to do their own thing. I think the only, um, the only proviso to, for that would be if all they wanted to do was their own thing and that was judged more collectively as not being, um, not contributing to the collective well-being, they could do it. But if that's all they wanted to do and didn't want to, any part of what they did to contribute in whatever way to what was judged to be part of the collectivity, I think that would be a problem. And I think that that would be uh, regarded as not playing the game, if you like. But I think the whole point about the society that I look forward to is that they would everybody would contribute to was needed for human flourishing, but there would then be plenty of time left over for them to do whatever else they wanted to do. But if they didn't want in any way to contribute to the collective good, then it seems to me it would be a problem and would be disapproved of, at least I would disapprove of it. I don't know whether other people would, but because I think that we have a collective responsibility for one another. And um, therefore, um, I'm happy for people to do things that, so long as they're not destructive uh, in whatever spare time, as if, if one wants to use the term spare time or free time. But on the other hand, I mean, lots of people actually love the work they do. And lots of people in our society don't love the work they do because it's not intrinsically rewarding or valuable. It might be actually be socially valuable, but it's not rewarding necessarily individually. So I think I don't really think there is a problem unless uh, you are suggesting that some people might want to be parasitic on what the other people are doing. And I think I would I would think that that would meet with social disapproval. So long as they do contribute and then the rest of the time they do what the hell they like, 
which is not destructive. That's absolutely fine. Indeed, that's the whole point of the society, to both try to create a situation where the work that needs to be done to produce what's needed for a civilised, flourishing human being leading a decent life uh, doesn't take up everybody's time. And therefore, there's plenty of time left to do all sorts of other things, which might be lying on a beach. Maybe a different way to um, maybe demonstrate what I what I mean is the question of if negotiated coordination is the mechanism with which these things are being mediated um, between each other. So you have the production unit, you have the co coordination bodies, you have the um, uh, planning committees, etc., etc. And in all of these instances, as far as I understood your model, there would be processes of negotiation involved in order to produce a collectively um, decided upon outcome. And that's how I understood it. And my point is that This is a very specific mode, a specific relay between these um, institutions, these layers of institutions. And this relay, this mechanism, this medium um, does suit specific types of persons, specific types of rationality, specific types of um, um, uh, qualities and qualifications better than others. So if we have people who have what in German is called Sitzfleisch, which are uh, just like really fucking stubborn and they want their will to get through and they will like push their head through the wall and stuff like that. And they might be like overly aggressive doing so. And so they dominate the group in a very um, bad way, in, in a way that, we, that is not um, uh, uh, supporting the, the uh, complete group. And um, this is something that you will actually experience in in groups that are self-organizing quite often. <laughs> that there's some asshole which kind of uh, pulls the, the the energy of of the room to himself, mostly men, and is being very dominant and is actually uh, sorry for for my French uh, fucking up the whole process. <laughs> and the point would be that if Negotiated coordination is the one relay, the one medium to transmit, to organize, to mediate, and etc. Then this is um, reducing the the ways in which different qualities of people, different qualities of information, etc. can be transmitted. This there's a there's a relation between the two. If there is a homo uh, passivus, they might really lose out within the meeting where everybody decides on how things should go along, you know, because she or he is the homo passivus and he's not bringing forward his position. Uh, maybe he's not reflected or he's not uh, self-conscious or whatever, you know, it's not, it's, uh, it's just the point that There's a variety of um, different um, valuable subjectivities and not all of them lie themselves naturally to a process of negotiated coordination. I guess that would be the point. No, I mean, I, I now understand what you're saying. I mean, we've all, I'm sure, you obviously have and I obviously have, met people like that who uh, try to dominate things or they're just like that. They're pushing themselves forward all the time. Uh, for whatever reason. So there are two things to be said about that, that I have to say about that. One is undoubtedly that at the moment can be a problem. But if somebody's chairing a meeting, you can usually keep such people under control. Not always, but you can usually keep them under control. And interestingly enough, in my experience, it's been easier to do that face-to-face -face than online. Uh, the only way you can do it online in the end is just to cut them off. But you don't want to do that. So face-to-face, -face you just say, no, look, come on. We've got to let other people have their turn. Uh, you know, endless ways of doing it. So that's the first thing to be said. That, that sort of behavior can be kept under control. And you can, and one of the skills of actually being a teacher is to find ways of bringing in people who tend to just sit there or 
be passive or in fact one of the things you really have to do if you're a good teacher is to find a way of doing that but the second thing is although um you get people who do behave that way at the moment i would expect that there'd be far fewer of them in a different society i wouldn't know how could i know whether they would uh, disappear completely but given the fact on the one hand that i think they can be kept under control by somebody who's chairing the meeting and on the other hand i think there'd be far fewer of them i can't see that that's going to be a big problem that they would behave in such a way as to prevent the tacit knowledge of other people or the passive knowledge of other people from coming forth or being brought drawn forth um so i can see the point you're making and it obviously is uh, is is a point that uh, as i say we've all experienced people like that uh but i don't see it as being insuperable yeah i i guess my, i would still stick to the point that i <laughs> i would uh, not, well i would only stick to the point that that i would argue for a a plurality of of methods as well i mean this the 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 idea of negotiated coordination i do uh, understand absolutely and i do think this is a very very valuable and essential part of the whole thing i just do think that we need like three four five six seven eight nine ten different other methods um that um like a company negotiated coordination in order to make things work at the end and i, like I guess that's your point as well give us an example of what one of these other methods might be i mean one of them and this has nothing to do with tacit knowledge i guess one of them would be the 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 use of uh, modern information and con communication technologies I thought that was uh, but it's actually. not only that it's not only that it's it's also that if someone does have an kind of intuition so to speak uh, in in terms of something that might well be useful for some kind of purpose but this person is uh, not very good in talking not very good in in communicating with other humans uh, or is like in general very much not suited for negotiated coordination as a person you know they they do not they 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 the way that they are set up does not lend itself nicely to this mode of of coordinating things like negotiated coordination then then i would say it might very well be that this person could bring rich things or ideas or whatever it might be at the end into the world Uh, even though he or she might not be suited for this mechanism of um, of negotiated coordination. And then the question would be, how would this person acquire the, for example, the resources to 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 bring into the world whatever he or she might want to to produce if this road is not hers or his? And no, I mean, I can see that. Um, I was going to say that uh If, per, if somebody has an intuition, um, there's no reason in the way I see the, the world, I envisage things, there's no reason why they shouldn't follow that intuition. The only way in which the problems that you're ra raising might um, arise is if in order to follow them, they need to do so collectively. And that's to say they need to involve other people and they can't convince other people that their intuition is worth following well that i can see that that could be a problem but i mean i don't really think that that's insuperable i mean in subsequent discussions and things that uh, fikret and i have written i mean one of the things that we've uh, thought of is that uh, you could have and, and other people have come up with similar ideas you could have um for example a body like a research council that um people could apply to and say, look, I've got this idea, and uh, I don't know whether it'll work or not, but I need some resources. So just like when you apply for a research grant, uh, but if you want to have access to collective resources, then there's got to be some way of the collective 
reaching a view on whether that's a useful uh, that's a worthwhile use of those resources. Now, some people in in dealing with this issue have suggested that everybody should have a certain allowance of resources, if you like, that they could use in whatever way they like or make available for anybody else to use on their behalf. That's one way of thinking about it. So there are a number of ways in which you can you can think about how do people get access to resources if they can't really convince anybody uh, that, the, that, that they should be able to use collective resources for that purpose. And maybe there isn't such a, maybe there is no way of doing that. I mean, it would that would be a form of total autarky. You could use social resources just because you wanted to, uh, which would be fine if you could uh, manage to uh, devise a system, which could include, of course, convincing other people that even though the outcome of your intuition is unpredictable, it's worth following. So I think you may be, you may be worrying about an issue which can't be solved, uh, but that may not be true, I don't know. It may, there are people who have, as I said, tried to dev devise ways of making resources available to do, even if you can't convince anybody else, like the fact that everybody would have an allowance yeah. that they could use themselves or mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. convey to other people. Yeah, and I guess it's a problem that is not uh, like unique to your model. It's, it will come up in, 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 in general if, if we want to decide about uh, how to spend the, the resources. Yeah. Okay, so how should we approach it if we would want to bring into existence negotiated coordination? What would be the the experiments, the next steps? Like, how would a transformation go about? How how should we approach it? Well, for me, I think that would involve the question of the unresolved question in my mind, and I think still unresolved of what is the political process through which we have to go in order to go beyond capitalism. Because uh, you, you couldn't have negotiated coordination of the sort that I have in mind within capitalism. So how do we get beyond uh, capitalism? I don't know if you've come across the work of this woman in America called Jody Dean. Her three most interesting, well, three that I've been most interested in books are first of all the one she called communist horizon the communist horizon and what she means by that is the horizon is a metaphor because horizons are a distinction between uh, what you can see and what you can't see beyond and the communist horizon is seeing beyond what you can't see to what you she would like to see which is communism. And that term distinguishes the communist view because it's a sharp discontinuity between what we've got and what we would like to move towards from social democracy or all these improvements within capitalism, the commons uh, and horizontalism and, you know, crack capitalism and all these things that are around. So that's the first thing. Then the second one is uh, her book called uh, Crowds and Parties. Crowds are what happens when you get these manifestations like the Occupy movement in New York or uh, mass demonstrations against a nuclear power station or uh, a new oil field or whatever. And they come and go and they're crowds. And they have a power and, a, you know, they carry people with them. People involved in them think, great, this is the future. But of course, it never is because uh, it comes and then it goes. So what she what she argues is what you need is a party that uh, has a, a continuity, learns, has a history uh, and so on. And the her third book is what the Americans called call comrades we call them comrades but never mind and uh <laughs> and there she's 
she's trying to draw a distinction between um, friends who you can disagree with but are still friends, family likewise, neighbours and so on, again allies, uh, but comrades are people who share the same values and vision that you have. And uh, she gets this, of course, from her study of parties. And uh, comrades then are people who you don't have to be friends with, you don't have to like, but if you're committed to the same project, then you you enter into a sort of sense of mutual obligation. If you're a comrade, you expect something from other comrades and they expect something from you. So this is just a rather convoluted way of saying a political process of how you get there. And here um, we move on to a different field altogether, which is um, my current sort of vision of the political process is uh, basically a Gramscian approach. Because uh, Gramsci has this idea that there will always be crises. There are small scale crises, but then there are what he calls an organic crisis, which is where the ruling class can no longer continue to rule in the same way that they have been ruling in the past. They don't only rule in the developed capitalist countries by force, they also rule by consent through hegemony and so on of, cap of ruling class ideas. And, um, and when it comes to an organic crisis, then there's a war of what he calls manoeuvre. There's a, a war of how the crisis is going to be resolved. And his argument is that the outcome of that war of manoeuvre depends upon the previous war of position, which is a long process probably of decades, in which there is a movement to try and create on the one hand a counter hegemony, an alternative way of trying to link everything together from the ruling class one. But on the other hand, equally importantly, if not more importantly, there, there is the creation of, in various sort of cooperative, associative, prefigurative ways, institutions of one sort or another, which can then be drawn upon when it comes to the war of manoeuvre. And he got this idea, he developed this idea, you probably know all about this, but he developed this idea when he was thinking about why was it that the Russian Revolution succeeded, but the Hungarian Revolution, the German Revolution, the other European revolutions didn't succeed. And uh, his analysis was that in Russia, with a relatively underdeveloped civil society, all the Bolsheviks needed to do was to see state power, which they managed to do, and then set about, if you like, creating the socialist consciousness, which was needed to build a different form of society. Whereas in Germany in particular, there was a well-developed civil society in which ruling class ideas held sway, even though they were not part of the state. And so although the revolutions looked as if they might succeed, and of course, in the Soviet Union, they hoped they would succeed because they didn't think they could build socialism alone in one country, but they didn't succeed. And Gramsci's view was that that was because the war of position, preparations building up to the revolution hadn't happened to the same extent because of the strength of civil society, which was imbued by um, ruling class ideas. So that's where this, I think that's where his view of the war of position. So that's how I see things uh, at the moment. I mean, you can't automatically apply something that was developed, well, probably 90 years ago, uh, or the rudiments of it were, to today. But nevertheless, it's a very interesting way, I think, of thinking about things. So that, I think, is what I would um, look to if I was thinking of, well, how can we move towards a post-capitalist society where negotiated coordination and social ownership has a chance of working? I do have one question that I ask all of my guests, 
And that would be, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? <laughs> yes, that was your last question, yes. Uh, it's a very good question. I was talking to Elena, my partner, about this. And um, we, we thought there might be a problem in thinking about the answer, which was what might happen in the future that isn't currently happening? Or does it mean, is there anything in the future that will continue to be in the future that you would particularly continue to find joyful? And we weren't quite sure which of those two ways of thinking about it. I mean, if it's the second, if it's something that I look forward to in the future uh, and um, it, it currently does happen, and I, I really appreciate it, and I find it joyful to see it continuing to happen, it would be, on the one hand, sort of uh, human resilience and creativity, and on the other hand, it would be the joys of experiencing non-human nature. There's been some wonderful programmes on our television, one by David Attenborough, who's always brilliant. And the other is a program which follows the seasons. We've just been watching Winter Watch and they, they have eight episodes of it where they've got people dotted around the country photographing uh, or observing and showing you uh, all sorts of wildlife in action. Um, which is you know, absolutely wonderful. So that, that's one side of it. If it was what would make me joyful, uh, oh, the other, the third thing of what's already happening, which would and does make me joyful, is to see young people getting involved in worrying about trying to do something about the climate, people like Greta Thunberg, people worrying, young people coming together, Uh, to campaign against child poverty or, you know, these things. Getting young people involved, not getting, seeing young people involved in that does make me feel good. If it's something that's not happening at the moment and uh, therefore, you know, I would, would like to see happen and would make it joy, would make me joyful in the future, I suppose, I suppose the main one would be... Um, If there could be, not unrelated to the first one, it, it, there could be, or would be, might be, some sort of um, agreement, which would have to be an international agreement, as things stand, to actually really do something, not talk about doing it, not, as Greta Thunberg puts it, blah, 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 um, but... Uh, would really do something about global warming, biodiversity loss, uh, and so on. Because it is, I mean, I wouldn't use this term, but you can see it's heartbreaking to see what's happening to biodiversity and the loss of natural species and so on and so forth. So I suppose it'd be those two different angles on it, what I would think about. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pat. This was absolutely Uh, great. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed it. Thank you for setting it up. Yeah, great. <laughs> That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories Or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.